delighted to be here this evening. And what I'd like to do is tell you almost a little history lesson because it goes way back in my career in, in terms of where we got started with eyes and then progresses through another sense, noses. And then as uh, my research evolved, uh, we, we got into uh, measuring biology instead of, uh, instead of mimicking it. So here's the outline. First, we're going to talk about mimicking biology, and then we're going to talk about measuring biology. And with respect to mimicking, I've collected a lot of things with biology that really are features of biological systems that if you're trying to, to mimic it, these are some of the features that you'd like to mimic. And you know, you can kind of read this and go through it, but you know, there's there's a lot of things in here. Some of these are, are big words, but you know, information rich, self-organizing, noisy. You know, these are things that we tend to not think about when we design technologies because we want to take noise out of the system. But the, the brain uses noise all the time as sort of a set point. The heart has intrinsic noise built into it. What I'd like to do is, is focus really on two senses this evening, uh, eyes first. And this is the compound eye of a very small fly. You can see what are called the pixelation. And the compound eye of an insect operates very differently from the eyes that we have. We have refractive optics. We have a lens. These are more like CCD cameras, more like CMOS cameras, the, the things that exist in your mobile phone. Because what they do is each of these little uh, simple eyes in this compound eye picks up just a little part of the full image. And then the brain reconstructs that in the insect. So it's not as if it's seeing something as we see, it sees pixelated images. And the technological analogs of this, this is a scanning electron micrograph, a very high magnification image of the camera that's in your iPhone. And each of these is a little detector that picks up just part of the image. But there's so many of these that when it projects back to us, the resolution in our eyes is not good enough to, to see the pixelation in the image that has actually been captured. This is a magnified version of the LCD screen in a, a Samsung you know, 4K high resolution television set. And there's blue, green, and red pixels. And one or two or three of these are on at a time to project a red, green, blue, or purple, or yellow, or white image on the screen. But when you look at that screen, as large as it is, you can't really see those individual pixels in that screen because your eye does not have the resolution to resolve that. But when you magnify it, you can, you can see it. And so that's, that's sim similar to the co compound eye of a fly. And so what we started working with very early in my research career were optical fibers. And this is the architecture of an optical fiber. It's the same type of thing that is used to bring cable into your house uh, and transmit information and data over, you know, in, in high speed. And it's comprised of really two critical elements here something called a core and something that surrounds that that is a cladding. And most of these fibers are made out of just two slightly different uh, versions of, of glass. One, the core typically is a very pure glass uh, that's, that's almost like quartz, a very pure glass made of silica. And then that, that cladding is made of a, of a doped uh, silica with a little bit of germanium in it that actually causes a, a very important feature of, of the optical fiber that I'll show you on the next slide. This other stuff here, the pink and the green region here, that's just the protective coating that allows you to handle these things because these fibers, this, this central core, is about the diameter of a human hair, could even be smaller than that. And even though you can wrap these things around your finger, uh, if they get any imperfection, they'll just break. And so they, they protect these things with a little bit of plastic coating. And so what I want to show you here is really the, the way that this works, and, and here you can see kind of a cross-section here. 
this is the core, and this is the cladding. And the only thing you really need to know about this optical fiber is that at that interface between the core and the cladding, that just that very microscopic layer there, uh, you get something called total internal reflection, meaning that that cladding acts as a mirror. And so when you shine light into the fiber, it bounces around, and it can bounce around. You can have a spool of, of optical fiber that's 100 miles long, and the signal will go all the way through that uh, because you lose very little light in an optical fiber. And so uh, you know, some, some uh, fibers need, some wavelengths need to have uh, amplifiers in them to sort of you know, boost the signal as they're going across the ocean, but usually they can go for about 100, 100 kilometers typically without any kind of, of amplification. So how do we make these things? Well, this was a technology that was developed at Corning Glass back in the late 1960s, and what is done is to create what's called a preform. And so these are cylinders of glass they're typically about the size of what you, you are actually seeing projected on the screen here. So they're you know, a few inches in diameter. There is a cladding in, there's a core in here, and then that's surrounded by another glass that's, that's a cladding. And what they do is they take what's called this big, gla this big glass cylinder that's called a preform, and put it into a, the top of, a, of a, about a two to six story drawing tower. So this building, put it at the top. And what you do is you begin to heat that fiber and glass begins to flow as it gets heated. And it begins to drip. It melts and drips and it drips and all the way down six stories onto this thing called a capstan that's just a rotating cylinder. And what happens is that thing begins to spool that optical fiber as it's melting, and it cools all the way down those two to six story uh, time that it's dropping through. And these things end up, they can be drawn to a, a variety of diameters depending on how fast the cylinder's rotating and how fast it's melting. But the remarkable thing about this whole process is that if you start here with, let's say, a, a two inch diameter core and a half inch diameter clad, the ratio of the glass in that very thin fiber that's the diameter of a hair is identical to the ratio of the glass in that initial preform. Okay? It's a remarkable thing. They both melt at the same rate. They both get drawn at the same rate. And you end up with, from a preform that you know, probably has that much glass, you can end up with literally thousands of miles of this hair-like optical fiber. How do we get back to eyes? Well, here is something called an optical imaging fiber. And so this is a fiber that has been drawn, it has a core and a clad, and what they do is after that first draw, they take them and they chop it up and they pack them and then draw it again. And then they chop that up and draw it again such that you end up with an array of optical fibers that now look like this. This is a, a large optical fiber array, but here's an optical fiber array that's pressed against a piece of stationery. And what you can see here is exactly that kind of pixelation that I was telling you about before with the eyes of an insect. That is, each of these optical fibers is carrying either a blue or a white image. And as you lower the resolution, you now no longer see that pixelation, it now is able to carry an image. I've got two things I'm going to pass around the room. Here's an imaging optical fiber. This has 60,000 individual optical fibers in it. And this is the end of a preform of one of these optical imaging fibers. 
So here, that's, that's the diameter that it started with. And you can see as it melted, it was drawn into that thing right there. Okay, and what I'd like you to do is, I'm going to pass my card around, but I don't know if this is going to work, but um, as I pass my card around, what you can do is you will hold it up to this, hold it up to the card right in, in contact with it, and you'll be able to see a magnified version because we're going from the small, small end to the big end. See a magnified version of my name or pictures on this card. And if you hold it up you know, to the light, you can actually see the structures of the, the individual fibers in here. So don't drop it. <laughs> we started with the, the eyes. And I'm going to show you how we can make a nose out of these eyes. This is taken from National Geographic back in the early 1980s. I, there, I haven't seen a better version of this. If you think about the 1980s, this turns out to be a pretty expensive experiment because they used LEDs. And back in the 1980s, LEDs were, were incredibly expensive. But they had an LED on this dog. And you know they had this, this, this is not a real pheasant. This is a, a well, it may, may have once been a real pheasant, but it's just a, it's been um, spiked with a little bit of uh, odor. And you can see this dog come in. You know, it, it probably can't see it, um, except you know, in this, in this uh, flash exposure. But you can, see, you, you, can, you can see the dog comes in. And the dog doesn't do this. The dog comes in and sort of goes in and out of the plume. It's tracking, right? Very complex behavior. And what is the dog doing during this time? It's sampling the environment. It's sort of comparing one sniff to the next sniff to see if the odor is increasing or decreasing so that it can begin to, to figure out where, where things are. To kind of orient you to the mammalian olfactory system, you know, after our nostrils is this very convoluted, what's called epithelium, sort of skin cells, for lack of a better term, that are populated with these olfactory receptor neurons. So these are just nerve cells that are sampling the, the odor. And they're sending signals back to a little pea-sized structure called the olfactory bulb that is, is actually like a little preprocessor. It takes all those signals from all those receptors in the, in the neurons, and it then sends a, a, a process version of that to the olfactory center in the, the cortical regions of the brain. And so here's the odorants that are coming into the olfactory epithelium. And these receptors are positioned here. And there's a very interesting feature here of, of uh, the mammalian system. And that is that you, you notice that there's red and green and blue receptors. And they're all kind of spread out throughout the, the region. They're, they're pretty much identical to one another. We actually, as, as, as mammals, we have um, about a thousand of these receptor types. For uh, mammalian systems, somewhere between uh, you know, 2 and 10 percent, depending on the, the organism, of the, the genes are, of, of the genes are actually devoted to the olfactory system. The thing that's important here uh, is that they converge. And so all the red ones converge. And all the blue ones converge, and all the purple ones converge, and all the green ones converge in this cartoon. And the reason that that's important is because if you, if you just had one receptor measuring these things, you wouldn't get much of a signal. But when you begin to, to, to have a 1,000 receptors, each of which is expressed tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands in dogs millions of times, then you get this signal to noise amplification. You get a square root of the number of receptors improvement in the, in the, the signal to noise. So if I had two receptors, square root of two is 1.4. Two over 1.4, pretty bad signal. If I have a million, square root of a million is 1,000. 
a thousand to one ratio in signal to noise. So you really get an improvement making these receptors converging onto the olfactory bulb and, and really amplifying the signal. And so here is some tracings that were done with the fruit fly. This is a fairly simple odor recognition system, but here's the most important feature of the olfactory system, and that is that you look at these six different odors here, and what you notice is that many of them respond to many different things. So here, this caproic acid and octanone, two very different compounds, two different odors, are being recognized by the same receptor here. But what's being processed is this pattern. So it's this pattern of response that actually is what gives the signal to the brain. And so here's a technical representation of this. Here's the odor. It's presented to this array. You get this response. The response is recognized as a pattern. And then the key for us is that when you first smell coffee, when you're two years old, you say, Mommy, what's that? And she says, oh, that's coffee. And you remember that. But here's a really interesting feature of the olfactory system. That is that those receptors that I showed you before are all replaced every six months. Every six months. Yet, we've all had this experience. You go into a, somebody's home for the first time and you say, gee, that smells like my grandmother's house. Right? You have that olfactory memory. And so something is keeping the wiring constant. And so this is a real challenge for those of us who try to mimic these kinds of systems in devices because unlike most sensors that have to be calibrated every time, if you had to train one of these kinds of things, if you had to train your nose every six months to recognize every odor you encountered in your life, you'd be in trouble. Why are we attracted to these artificial noses? Well, because when we use patterns, we can reduce the number of sensors because we get combinations that are unique. When you have 10 sensors, you can make lots of different combinations out of those 10 sensors, when they're, which ones are on, which ones are off, and each one of those will give you some, some information. Um, and so what we, we try to do, instead of making a sensor for glucose and a sensor for cholesterol, and we take advantage of the principles of the olfactory system so that it recognizes everything. It's anticipatory. We don't have to worry about trying to make something that is specific for everything because that would take thousands or tens of thousands of sensors if we wanted to measure everything. What we do is we train the system to recognize everything that we're really interested in. It transfers the burden from trying to make lots of different sensors to the, to the uh, com computational processing. So how do we do this? In our first iteration, what we did is we took a bunch of these optical fibers, not the one you saw here, but the ones that are like the communication fibers, the ones that have a single core and a single clad, and we coated them with different fluorescent polymers. And then we took advantage of this ability to now present these odors in a pulsatile fashion. So similar to a sniff, we just were going to puff a, a vapor on these, this sensor array that has 19 different polymers on them, and we're going to sniff it, and we're going to watch the, the temporal response. So what I'd like to show you now is a movie. Okay, this is a 19-fiber sensor array being exposed to benzene. So there you go. That's Play it again a couple times. It looks almost lifelike. What does this look like? So we digitize these data, and here's the response. This slide, for some reason, did not come out when I imported it into my new computer. So there's a yellow and a black line for every one of the traces. But you can see, you know, this sensor goes up fast, this sensor goes down, and we're using these temporal responses, and we we train a computer and we say this is the response of these 19 sensors to benzene and we expose it to a bunch of different things 
And here's what we get. This is the true identity of these 20 different compounds, vapors that we exposed it to. And this is what the computer tells us it thinks these things are. So acetone, very simple organic molecule. The computer gets it right 24 out of 24 times. And these were presented in random order, by the way. They, they weren't just 24 presentations of this and 24 presentations of that. Anything on the diagonal is correct, but anything off diagonal means it made a mistake. So let's look at this. Here's a, this, this doesn't look right here. This is number 10. We know number 10 is this, I guess, cologne. And it mistakenly thought it was number three. Well, number three is a perfume. So it, it's making mistakes that are similar to what the kind of mistakes that we would make. You know, if you're presented with a Cabernet and, you know, maybe you can't tell the difference between Napa and Bordeaux. The goal of this was actually to, to, to build these things to sniff explosives uh, for, for, for buried landmines. Um, so here, this is a very low concentration of a nitroaromatic compound like TNT that's put into water you know, to sort of train dogs. So number 19 is correctly identified 20 out of 24 times, but four times out of 24, it's mistaken as number 11, which is water. So it actually can smell water because Machines can do that, people can't. We've kind of recapitulated the, the mammalian system, but I told you that there's a problem. The problem is that if we made this sensor array and we trained it, it's like replacing your receptors every six months. If you had to retrain your brain, you'd have a problem. You wouldn't recognize anything that you previously had smelled. How do we get around that? Well, we'd like to be able to do this. We'd like to train one sensor, develop a computational recognition system, and then have that transfer to any other sensor we make after that so that they can be used for a long time. And so this is where we get to these optical imaging fibers. We discovered that we could selectively etch the cores of the fiber relative to the clad material. I told you that they were slightly different kinds of glass. One's a slightly softer glass, is able to be etched with something called hydrofluoric acid. It's what they use to make frosted glass. And so what we created here are these little wells at the end of the fiber, but here's, there's still a core here at the bottom of the well that is able to, to shine light into that well. Well, we filled these things with little plastic beads that had fluorescent dyes attached to them. You know, one of these beads is sized perfectly to be able to fit into a well. And one bead and one bead only, and it sort of snuggles in there, and it's stuck in there. And so what we did is we made a bunch of these little beads. These are really tiny. They're three microns in diameter. That's smaller than a cell, okay? smaller than a human cell. In one gram of these, so kind of a thimbleful, there's about 10 billion of these beads. We mixed them all together, and then we displayed them randomly into the 60,000 wells on that little piece of glass that is coming around. So there's 60,000 of these beads. There's about 10 uh, different bead types, so there's 6,000 beads of each type. That's the amplification we need, we just figure out where the beads are by exposing them to a vapor, and the green beads respond this way, the blue beads this way, red beads this way, and the computer can recognize those unique responses, and then map the array, and every array is mapped differently, but they, it contains the same bead types in there. Here's the bead types, you can see the chemistry there. This is 40 beads, so they're highly reproducible, but you know, you can sort of see when you pulse this compound DMMP on here, you can see the beads changing, and then they return to baseline a few seconds later. Here are very low concentrations, parts per billion of some compounds, kind of in the range that dogs can smell explosives. Any one of these signals is really noisy. You can kind of see it right here. But if you take a thousand of them and you sum them up, this is what I was getting at before. The noise 
kind of averages out and the signal builds up and you begin to see a very robust, strong signal. And so you, you have the ability now to begin to smell things very sensitively. And because you have 10 billion beads in a gram, you can make millions of sensors out of these. And so we did that. And these are with three different sensors over a period of months. And you can see we, we were almost perfect with our ability to train a computational classifier and then completely replace that with another artificial nose. So I want you to see there's 17,700 exposures of which only 400 contained anything. Most of them were just blanks, just air, because we wanted to see if the system picked up anything by mistake that wasn't really there, and it never did. You know, these are the sensor responses to different coffees, different cheeses. You can see with your own eyes that they're different responses, right? They're smelling things differently, and we can train a computer to recognize these and, and use them. So when we're talking about mimicking um, biology, we decided to see why do dogs have these big, long noses? And you know. So we took a CAT scan of a dog's nose. Uh, this was done at, at Tufts Vet School. And you can see, this is the cross-section. This is the olfactory epithelium. Remember I told you it's highly convoluted? You can really see how much surface area there is in a dog's nose. And this is another cross-section a little bit further back toward the, the eyes. There's lots and lots of olfactory cells here that are really um, amplifying the signal. Laser prototype this dog's nose. We made all those convolutions, made a plastic mold. We cut it in half after we were done with this experiment. We actually stuck our sensors into different regions of the nose. Same sensors, same, same chemistry. What you can see is this is a single sensor put in different regions of the dog's nose. The same sensor in different parts of the dog's nose actually see different things because the odors are actually separating, they're partitioning. So complex odors are presenting different things to different places in the dog's nose, even though they're the same sensor. You know, this is kind of a fun experiment. Rums, perfumes, vodkas. And in every case, we got an improvement in our ability to classify these things by just putting the sensors in different parts of the dog's nose. These are hard things. It's alcohol and water, essentially. We got an improvement in, in performance. Diverse sensor types allow you to be anticipatory. We have replicates that improve their sensitivity. And then we have the ability to make these things reproducible that allows you to maintain training over a long period of time. So we've talked about mimicking biology. Let me spend a few minutes talking about measuring biology. I know there's some non-scientists in the audience. This is what's called the central dogma, DNA gets converted into RNA, many copies of RNA, and then RNA gets translated into protein. And these are the micro wells on the end of this fiber. And we first came up with these etched well technologies. This was what was referred to as micro well arrays back when we did this in the late 19, 1990s. And I've gone back and sort of done calculations, but this particular fiber has a thousand times as many wells as that piece of plastic. In terms of the volume that one of these wells can hold relative to the volume one of these can hold, it's five billion times smaller. I always tell people now, if you have that many zeros in front of or, or after something, pay attention to it. You know, I already showed you that we can functionalize these beads with polymers that give you measurements that replicate the olfactory system. Then we start attaching single strands of DNA to these beads to be able to measure the presence or absence of a complementary sequence of DNA that was present in a solution. So, you know, DNA or RNA, DNA is double, double stranded, it's a double helix. You can unwind that and then you can measure whether that the complementary strand is present by probing it with a complementary strand that's attached to your surface here. Or you can bind RNA and measure that. And so when we began to do this with these beads, it turned out to be a pretty transformative thing. And the reason it was transformative is that we have these little microwells, we have these little beads, we just 
put a droplet of these beads on top of this micro well array and the beads go in the wells, we don't have to do any sort of complex assembly. It's just a self-assembly process. And so we published this paper. You know, this is exactly that fiber that I passed around. It's 13,000 wells. It's a very small part of that. So there's four of these areas that you could actually interrogate. And at the time that we published this, this was the smallest size of one of these DNA arrays that could be made. And so now we came up with a way of being able to measure essentially a thousand things in the same area that you previously could only measure one. And so this really transformed the whole field of genetic analysis. We founded a company, many of you who are in science recognize the name of this company, it's called Illumina. This is the first product, it was 96 of those fibers that I passed around the room, positioned in perfectly to fit into those little 96 well plastic plates that I showed you a couple slides ago. And then over time, they started making them, etching them in silicon. And you know, now one of these slides can, you know, has literally hundreds of billions of beads and can measure 20 million letter differences in DNA between two samples. And at the time that we you know, first came out with this technology, people were charging a dollar per letter of DNA. And today, it's less than a 10,000th of a cent. And so what is that enabled? That's enabled things that you're very familiar with. So this is the technology that's behind 23andMe. I would call it recreational genomics, but they did get approval for a consumer colon test. It's also the technology that's used to measure the genetic diversity in populations. They use these things all the time for breeding uh, cattle, for breeding corn. There's all sorts of things that these things are used for, and the company has become incredibly successful with lots of people. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is proteins. They're the, the catalysts, they're the enzymes that are catalysts that make all the reactions happen in our body. But the problem has been that there's a technology, this has been around about 50 years, called ELISA. It's the way that the clinical tests for proteins are measured. It's called an immunoassay. And it's able to measure things in this concentration range. So this is millimolar to picomolar. And it's known that in the bloodstream, there's 325 proteins that are in that concentration range. But after the human genome was sequenced, it was determined that of those 20,243 genes that code for the proteins in our bodies, about a fifth of those, about 4,000 of those, should be present in the blood. It's just that we don't have a way to measure them. So imagine what we could do if we could measure all those proteins. And so we developed something called SAMOA. So just representing all the proteins that we couldn't measure back you know, 10 years ago. And so we developed this technology. This is what ELISA does. It measures the intensity of a color proportional to the concentration of a protein. And this is what we do. We have come up with a way to literally digitize the signals of individual molecules. So these are signals that are coming from the binding of individual protein molecules. And it's an absolute measurement. You know, here, if I asked you what's the concentration here, you'd have to have something to compare it to, right? You'd have to hold it up to, to a little card and say, oh yeah, I think it's somewhere between these two colors. Here, this is absolute. There's four molecules right there. You don't have to calibrate. And so we published this eight years ago. So the first thing we attempted was to measure something called PSA. There's a few men with gray hair in the room here. You know, PSA, this is prostate-specific antigen. It's been discredited for screening for prostate cancer because men have very uh, different baseline levels of this. And it turned out that this single molecule approach, the Samoa approach, is able to detect PSA at levels that are about 3,000 times lower in concentration than the standard ELISA that I showed you. This was also been commercialized by a company that's based in Lexington. The arrays are actually DVDs. They're made by Sony on the same line that they used to make DVDs. How many of you have bought a DVD lately? So that's why Sony's making these things now. 
I know this is art and science, so my friend Felice Frankel took a beautiful image of these. So here's these micro well arrays that are literally embossed on the surface of these uh, DVDs. There are three micron wells. There's 216,000 of them there. Here's why we wanted to measure PSA, because men who've had prostate surgery, they have their prostate removed, and this molecule, this protein that gets produced by the prostate gland, that disappears. But if there was residual tumor that was left in when they, the surgeon took the tumor out, or if there was metastasis prior to the surgery, then that cancer begins to grow back. And over time, it grows back above the range that now it can be measured. Because the tumor's larger, there's more PSA that's being produced by these prostate cancer cells. And every six months, the patient goes in and gets a blood test. And most of the time, they say, oh, we can't detect it. We can't detect it. We can't detect it. And then they go come back, and somebody says, oh, I have bad news for you. You, you have a recurrence of your prostate cancer. Well, we didn't think that was the best way to approach things. First, we took 20 men who were unmeasurable. These were men who'd had their prostate removed through surgery, and they were unmeasurable using the conventional test. Here's the limit of detection of the conventional test. We could measure every one of them. And here's our limit of detection. This is a log scale, so we've got a long way to go. But Look at there's huge variation here. I'm not saying that this person's going to recur or this person's not going to recur. It's just, isn't it better to know the number and to be able to say it's increasing over time? We probably think you've, you've got residual cancer, and therefore we're going to treat you before it gets uh, super bad. Well, this was a retrospective study, and what this shows is that we could predict with a single blood test between three and six months after surgery with 100% confidence that these men would not have recurrence of prostate cancer. So these, this is a retrospective study. They'd collected samples over a long period of time. This went out to five years. We could tell somebody, a man, between three and six months after their surgery, you don't have to worry about it. But if you have levels below this, you better worry because only 35% of those men were cancer free after five years if their level between three and six months was above that concentration level. So we decided to do something for women because we think we have the ability to measure a tumor that is one millimeter in diameter. Five millimeters, this is the best you can do with imaging. This is mammography. The best mammography picks up a tumor this big. This is what we think we can do by measuring blood-borne biomarkers. And the difference in volume is 125 times. So the idea is, if you can detect these things early, you have the ability to maybe watch and wait and see if something develops over time. Or if it just stays the same, you don't have to treat. So we're not advocating over-treatment and over-diagnosis. We just like to know. And so this, these are the statistics. Pretty pretty bleak, a quarter of a million new cases of invasive breast cancer every year, and smaller number of non-invasive breast cancers. One in eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer and 40,000 deaths. It is absolutely true for breast cancer, as well as for other cancers, that the earlier you detect, the better the outcome. It's pretty much 100% survival if you detect it early. So we ran some samples. These are some preliminary results with 66 newly diagnosed women with breast cancer prior to their therapy. We took a blood sample, consented them, and then we trained a system to recognize eight proteins that we had identified that we thought might be useful for early detection of breast cancer. This is all healthy patients versus breast cancer patients, so all breast cancer, all stages, and we get accuracy of 96%. Mammography, by the way, is 82%, okay? A lot of false positives, some false negatives. When we only look at early stage breast cancer, the accuracy goes up a little bit. So we think we have a blood test that can do early detection of blood cancer by measuring proteins that have never been measured before. So these are just eight. We're now up to 30. You know, we've got 
about 400 samples now that we're going to start running through and, and begin to, to consent. Whirlwind tour of the optical system of insects, of mammalian noses, of measuring genes and measuring proteins. And of course, you know, I could not have done this myself. It requires a large number of people. And this is just current group members and maybe a few former ones that I think were particularly important for putting in here as either collaborators or former students who had contributed to some of the things that I talked about today. So happy to answer any questions. Delighted to be here and thanks.